from me Holding nothing back you are great to see you at Spent Time this morning uh, this morning, we, we get to start our, our new sermon series. So as you've just seen that, that lovely little diagram uh, uh, that came up on the, on the screen, uh, we're looking through Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11. And it's uh, that idea of uh, being inspired and learning from those who have gone before us. So before we get, we really dig into the start of Hebrews 11, let's give a, a little bit of context to why the writer of Hebrews 11 writes what he writes in Hebrews 11. Um, so the book of Hebrews is, is all about who Jesus is and how he is better and greater than any other being, any other teaching and any other religious system. It opens with a comparison between Jesus and the Old Testament prophets. It explains the wonderful truth of how God spoke through the prophets, but then describes how Jesus is even better. He is the heir of all things. He was involved in creation. He is the ultimate revelation of God. And he is your sustainer. And he is your redeemer. And the reason for all this lies in, in who Jesus is. And then just preceding chapter 11 is, is chapter 10, obviously. Uh, and and the, the writer of Hebrews is writing to a people who, who clearly have gone and are going through persecution under uh, the Roman rule. And there's a, a lot of encouragement in chapter 10. And I just wanted to read the end of, of chapter 10 just before the writer kicks in for chapter 11. And, and so we're going to start in chapter 10 uh, and we're just going to read from verse 36 uh, down to the end. It says, you need to preserve so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And I, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we, but to those who have faith and are saved. Let me read that last bit again. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. What comes next then is an encouragement to those people who are feeling persecuted, who are feeling under attack, who are looking for reasons to keep going. The writer of Hebrews is now imploring those and saying, we are not going to be like those who have shrunk back. No, no, we are going to persevere in faith. We're going to keep going. It is a wonderfully in, a message of encouragement to those who are right, who were reading the letter at the time, but even for us today, who go through all different kinds of persecution who go through hardship, times of trial. We go through times when our faith ebbs and it flows, when it's riding high and when it's hitting the depths, the mountain tops and the valleys. And you want to know why to keep going to all those times where the writer of Hebrews gives you the reason. Persevere so you claim what is yours. Keep going so you do not lose. And let's look at those who have gone before for evidence of what happens when we persevere. And he uses this word faith, those who have faith and are saved. So what, what is faith? Well, I, we used to, I was a youth worker for 10 years, we used to play a game with young people, and we used to um, get any sort of cool object, a, a chair, a couch, a table, what, whatever, and we used to get them to stand on the, on the object, and then we'd, we'd blindfold them, they'd put their hands across their body like this, and we'd, they were standing on the edge of it, and we'd then say, right, count down from 10, and when you get to one, I just want you to fall backwards. But before they did that, they were obviously blindfolded, and then we would all leave the room. And we said, count down from 10, and when you get to one, fall backwards. Now, of course, of course, we were there when they fell, and the idea was that they would fall and we would catch them, and it was a, it was a, a trust exercise. But every fall 
was an act of faith. Every fool said, I trust that you are going to be there like you said you were. Every fool was them saying, I have faith that you will catch me. And every fool was saying, I am willing to put myself on the line for the faith that I have in you. I, I am happy to report that it never went badly wrong. You can see videos of when this goes wrong. So <laughs> there were some kids who rightly so weren't always willing to fall backwards. And there was hesitancy. There really was. But every fall was an act of faith and showed trust. And they were sure that we would catch them. So faith, faith is trust in God. And faith and, and being sure are, are not opposed. The writer of Hebrews at the start of Hebrews 11 says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. St. Augustine wrote, God does not expect us to submit our faith to him without reason. But the very limits of our reason make faith a necessity. Faith is a bird that sings when the dawn is still dark. Faith describes your whole relationship with God, trusting him, leaning your whole weight upon Jesus and having the courage to act on the faith. So why, why then at the end of chapter 10, would the writer of Hebrews jump into chapter 11 and start listing all these different people. You know, a light shines brightest in the darkness, doesn't it? And faith is visible. We recognize it in other people. We take comfort from it, are inspired by it. We learn from it. The, the Free Methodist Church, you know, indeed the Freedom Church that you are a part of, which is a part of the Free Methodist uh, denomination, we often look back to the great faith of the Wesleys, where we live in Kingswood, is built up on the great faith of the Wesleys, John in particular. And you see all around the world, people put faith in goalkeepers to save a penalty. People put faith in doctors to save them. We're putting faith at the moment in a vaccine. And that faith says we trust. But that faith is, is not merely based on hope and hope alone. There's evidence involved as well. And this is evident that the writer shows us in chapter 11. You know, and, and going back to that analogy of the young people, once young people have seen that others were caught, they were more willing to give it a go. There was a boldness. There was a, an assurance. There was some kids that actually sort of jumped back. You know, they, they would suddenly be acting with such a confidence. They had nothing to fear. They weren't going to hit the floor. We were going to catch them. It didn't matter that we were leaving the room. We could turn the lights off. We could do a whole other different range of these activities. It didn't matter to them. They knew they were going to be caught. You see, by looking and listening and learning from those who went before, their faith increased. They saw what could be achieved by their acts of faith. It gave them boldness to do what they maybe wouldn't have done before. And just to note that none of the people mentioned in Hebrews 11 are perfect. Indeed, they're not mentioned because they're perfect. They're not mentioned because they're better, because for some reason God set them apart because they are superior to us. No, they're mentioned simply because of their faith and what their faith enabled them to do. And what, why do we call these people pioneers? Because they went before us. They did what had never been done. They showed us the way and said, follow. That's why these early people are faith pioneers. Are we willing to learn the lessons that they are still wanting to teach us and to answer that call to follow? So looking back at them, uh, let's get in, let's now dig into Hebrews 11. Let's read uh, from uh, 11, 1 to 7, and then let's see what we can learn from these titans of faith. So here we go, in verse, uh, starting in chapter 11, verse 1, here we are. 
Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. visible. By faith, Abel brought God, uh, brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when he spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from, his, from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, is it possible? It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in a holy fear built an ark to save his family by by his, by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. So what can we learn from these pioneers of faith, from these guys who went before us? More on faith leads to understanding. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. St. Augustine pointed out that faith is the first step to understanding. Understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. Number two, faith impacts last beyond your lifetime. Able, even though he is dead, he still speaks through faith. I don't know if it's true. We're talking about it this morning. The writer of Hebrews is writing about Abel. Think about all the people that, that have, uh, have since passed. People like Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, um, Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Why do we still speak of these people? Why do we still talk about the Wesleys? Because of their faith. Their faith is still speaking to us from beyond the grave. It has an echo that goes beyond the generations, that goes through the generations, that cries out to us, that says, hey, look what can be achieved when you put your faith in the right place, in the right person, when you put your faith in Jesus. Look at what you can do. The writer of Hebrews is telling us about people who have gone before of their great faith to say to us keep going don't give in don't stop no matter how bad it gets keep going because look at what happened when these guys did faith leads to righteousness by faith abel offered to god a better sacrifice than cain did by faith he was approved as a righteous man why was he approved as righteous because of his faith it's Faith that Jesus died for us, that he lives for us, that he rose again, that he's taken away our sins, that we can enter into a free life through him. It's that that leads us to receive the gift of righteousness that Christ has for us, that he desires to give us. Yes, Abel acted, but he acted because he first had faith to act. And that faith, was, a, was what made him be approved as a righteous man. Number four, faith pleases God. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. And Enoch pleased God, and as a result, he skipped death completely. The writer goes on to explain that it's impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must first, must first believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. You won't do anything if you don't believe, firstly, who God says he is. And secondly, what he says about you. I says, yes, God, I believe. 
And it's because of that that I will do. Which leads us on to number five. Faith leads to action. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world. Uh, Lauren, you've got a few pictures. Could you just put the first one up for me? If none of you have ever understood the scale of the ark, I just wanted to show you a picture of the size of it. So that actually is, is a, a replica of the ark uh, that exists in um, America. Uh, so if you ever hear of a flood, that's where I'm going to be. Um, and there's another picture, Lauren. If you could just show the second picture. Look at the scale of what God asked Noah to do. Yes, th those, those are people next to that monstrous uh, construction. Can you imagine being asked to build the ark? Something never done before. Yeah, there would be a flood, something that's never happened before. In a time when people were actively walking away from and rebelling against God. Look at the scale of what God asked Noah to do. And why was Noah tasked with this job? Because he had faith. He was a true pioneer. Noah heard God, then he acted. What God told him to do, he did. And as a result, he saved his family and humankind. Faith enables us to do far more than we can do ourselves. As we were praying earlier, I just thought God say, even the smallest act of faith can have the most mighty results. Never underestimate a small act of faith and what that can do. Just faith as small as a mustard seed, and you can move mountains. Is what Jesus said. And James tells us that in the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. That's James two seventeen. He go he goes on like the right of Hebrews to point to people who have gone before. Their faith leads to actions, which leads to God being glorified, His will being done. You know, faith. Faith may be an invisible thing, but its effects are powerfully seen. Just imagine seeing that ark that was built by faith. Now I've got to ask, what's the ark in your life? What is God calling you to do that may seem impossible, incomprehensible, that may cause people to ridicule you? Have faith that works. Don't have faith in yourself. Have faith in Jesus, the true pioneer, the true author and perfecter, the true reason for hope. You know, when God called me and Liz to, to live in Four Oaks, which was a very affluent area when we first got married, we had no money at all. Uh, and, and it was a new bill that we felt God to call us to. And all we had was we had the amount of money for the deposit, which we would have lost if we weren't able to find the rest of the money uh, to, to pay for it. By faith, we did it. And by faith, we watched as God brought in everything we needed at just the right time. And we were then able to live and work in that community and see God do amazing things. It may seem ludicrous, but God calls us to have faith and faith that makes us good. Don't worry about ridicule, ridicule, because you're in good company. And don't worry about ability, because God equips the call. And lastly, faith leads to intimacy with God. As a result of his actions, Noah became intimate with God. When you have faith in someone, when you, when you trust them, your relationship with them grows and the intimacy of it grows. When you fully trust someone to catch you when you fall, when you fully trust somebody to be there no matter what, when you fully trust somebody to say, I'm willing to place my life in your hands, then you enter into an intimate relationship with a God who will do all that he had promised to do. 
So do you want intimacy with God? Exercise faith. So do you want to, do you want understanding, righteousness to please God, to be moved to action? Do you want intimacy with God? Let's learn from those who have gone before us. Let's learn these lessons that they cry out and tell us. If you want faith, good. Because God wants to increase your faith.